So my name is Dylan and this is Leslie. We both work with the Toronto Library System. Um, so I am a research data librarian and Leslie does digital scholarship. So we hope with this partnership that we're going to start off talking a little bit about the philosophy or ethos behind why thinking about managing your data is a very important part of your research process. And then we're going to take over with some more technical things after that. So the first part will be just a little bit of groundwork as to why this type of information is important to think about. Um, and we hope that you'll leave a little bit more thoughtful about managing your data. How do you move forward? So why should you care? Um, as we heard as you went around the room, you all know your data and you all know your research process. But we want to talk about what goes into um, some more detailed things about managing your data and how to plan ahead for some of it. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about your future self uh, because data management is about future possibilities. So uh, the reality is that as time elapses, memories fade, information becomes less clear, and context becomes very valuable. Oh, you're doing it? Oh, okay. oh. all right. So we're now talking about <laughs> scholarly <laughs> reasons. Um, so managing your data can help maximize the transparency, accountability, and scrutiny of your research findings. What this means is it can help other people understand what you've done if they wish to replicate or rerun an experiment. It also allows future collaborators or your current collaborators to take up where you left off without duplicating your efforts. Um, and it allows your data to serve as evidence of your process and your method. So the idea of data management supports other actions as well, such as preservation or sharing. And we'll talk about the life cycle of data in a minute. Okay. So there's also, you may be asked by some people uh, to manage your data, so there may be some less altruistic reasons to do so. One of them is the Research Ethics Board, um, or you may be asked for other actions like sharing or preservation that actually require management to get your data ready. So if you go work with any human subjects, you'll have to go through the Research Ethics Board at University of Toronto, which asks you things about how you're going to work with data, who's going to have access, how you're going to restrict or um, delete or dispose of data in the future. So you'll need to plan ahead if you're starting any work with human subjects. Um, also, actions may be mandated by your funding agency or your publisher. Usually these are things that have to do with preservation or sharing of data. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Just a quick question. Who has gone through this? I mean, like, the guys working with epilepsy data who have gone through this? Yeah. Or no, wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so restrictions and like uh, we can't have any patient related related information, so we have to keep that confidential. But so one is one of the problems that we have how to keep it confidential oh. but knowing some information about the patient at the same time. Right. So, so did your group have to fill out the research, research yeah. ethics application? Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of that's kind of like a mini, mini data management plan where you have to think ahead of these things. Um, fortunately for people working with human subjects, that's data that's done by the university and there's a process for that. If you're not working with human subject data, it's still an important part to, to plan ahead for. But the kind of the thing that more might hit everybody in the room would be something like um, a publisher sharing policy. So this is just an example um, of some of the wording from Nature, which is pretty prolific in their publications across most fields. So they require you to make materials, data, associated protocols promptly available. Um, depending on the type of publication that you're publishing in, they'll have different requirements or restrictions. Uh, if you have certain types of data, there may be certain places you have to put it. Otherwise, they just might ask you to make it available. Um, we'll go into more about publishing your data and sharing it in a second. There's also requirements from funding bodies in Canada. So I want to make the distinction that preservation and sharing and management are three separate actions. So you can do any one of them without doing any of the others. Um, for preservation in Canada, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC, has a policy that if you get funding from them, you have to keep your data for two years. Um, CIHR has a similar policy, but they specify you have to keep your data for five years. So this doesn't necessarily mean making it available to anyone, but that any point in that time period they could ask for your data and you have to be able to supply it to them. Is this a time period after you publish? 
Um, yeah. After the yeah, month. it's basically when the funding ends, you have to keep the data. Oh, it's when the funding ends. Yeah. It's not at the time that you publish the paper, then you no. need to keep this after your fund. That leads into the sharing, <laughs> which is um, there. there is one policy in Canada to do with data sharing, which is making it available, and that's upon um, publication. You have to make the data available to everyone. Uh, so CIHR has specific rules and guidelines around certain types of data and where they have to go. NSERC doesn't have a preservation or sharing policy at the moment, but it doesn't mean it's out of the realm of possibilities in the near future. So the idea that management um, goes into the supporting these other operations, if you know you have to keep data for two or five years, you're going to need to know which type of data or which of your data you need to keep and where you're going to put it, how it's going to be managed, um, and how you're going to get rid of it, and who's responsible for that. Uh, requirements in Canada are kind of changing at the moment. So one of the things we can look at is the US. There's been a lot of movement. Um, we have had similar policy movement between Canada and the US. The most notable thing that happened recently was the open access publishing. So we encountered that last May, where any um, of the tri-agencies, NSERC, SHRC, or CIHR, you have to make your publication available within 12 months, very similar to the US. So a couple years ago, the US started putting in um, policies saying that you have to submit a data management plan along with any grant application. So we think that there could be movement in that area in Canada in the near future. So that will require, similar to what you do with the Research Ethics Board, going through, saying the type of data you work with, how you're going to work with it, who's working with it, and what you're going to do with it. So you also might want to think about managing your data for the purposes of uh, increasing your own research impact. So once we start to think about data as an output in and of itself, we can do things like publish it. So you can put it in a repository, publish it as a data paper, and again, we'll talk about that later when we're talking about sharing data. But the idea here is that if data is published, it can be citable. And if it's citable, it can be included in metrics which measure your research impact. Um, and if it's included in metrics, this can also increase your research profile. There's also the idea that if you are managing your data and able to share it, you can um, contribute to the public good. The idea here is that all researchers involved in a project can get attribution for the data that they work with, not just the people that publish the paper, which would be nice. Um, data can also serve as an educational resource, and that it promotes, promotes the idea of innovation. Um, perhaps someone will look at your data and use it for something that you would never have intended it for, and that new research can come out of research that you, know, you never thought was a possibility. But most importantly, you might want to consider managing your data more actively for your own sanity. So managing your data saves time and effort. It avoids, as I said, the duplication of efforts. You can easily find what you need and make it available. You'll know things like what version you're looking at, who's responsible for storing, maintaining, or backing it up. Um, it helps with collaborative research. So in a group um, that you're working together, you're able to make decisions and all do the same thing. Um, and it also helps you understand what your data means in the future. So imagine yourself five years from now looking at your files. Would you know what they are? Would you know what they contain? And also managing data, as I've said a few times now, enables things like preservation and sharing. So we just want to talk a little bit about what we call the data life cycle. And this is a very simplistic view of the data life cycle. But we're looking at this from the perspective of data as a product rather than an instrument of research. So we can recognize that there's different states that data goes through, raw, processed, analyzed, published, and that there's different things that need to be done or that are important about data at different points in this life cycle. So it's an iterative process, not really a linear one. You can enter at any point and you can double back within this cycle. So basically the idea of managing data is thinking about data at every stage and anticipating future needs and you do that at the start in a planning phase. So this might help understand that cycle a little bit better, just a visual of how data can move through the life cycle. So we start with raw data, which is what is being measured or observed. So this is the data that's generated or collected during a research project. In this example, we just have a sensor taking measurements from Lake Superior um, on a daily basis. Process data is how can raw data be made useful for 
our example here, we might clean it, remove erroneous errors that have occurred, um, and then put it into a spreadsheet if we're being very simplistic for manipulation. The analyzed data is looking at what can the data tell us, is it significant, and how so. So for our example, we might find the average temperatures, we might look at seasonal fluctuations, we might demonstrate some graphs that, or we might generate some graphs that demonstrate these changes. And then we have finalized or published data, which is how does the data support your research question? And in our example, we might take the um, average temperatures from 2009 and compare them to 2013, and how is this st statistically significant? So the idea of planning, as I said, happens at the start of that data life cycle, and it's a really important thing to think about and to actually carry out once you do. So we mentioned something called a data management plan. So it's just a short document that you prepare in the planning stage of a project to plan for all the things that you need to think about while managing data over the course of your project. So it helps to anticipate challenges and helps to mitigate concerns. So these are just some of the types of questions that would be asked in a data management plan. So imagine for a grant application from NSERC, SHRC, or CIHR, if you were asked to provide this information on the start of your research. You need to think a little bit differently than if you just start a project and don't write, don't answer these questions. The important thing about a data management plan is it's basically just a set of questions. It has nothing to do with a tool. You can write one in Notepad, you can write one in Word, but there are tools available that can help you and guide you through the process. So there's DMP Tool, which is a U.S. initiative, DMP Online, which is a U.K. initiative, and Portage, which is a recent Canadian initiative, still in beta um, form. But what these usually do is they map to uh, a funding agency requirements, and they ask you questions that are typical within your research area or to the fund that you're applying to. So it just helps you think concretely about what you're collecting and how you're going to work with it. But again, you don't need to use these tools. They're just available if you want to. They walk you through the questions. This is just an example of what a data management plan can look like. It, you can section it off to talk about the different questions, or you can write it like an essay like this person did. That's the portage one. Uh, it's linked somehow to the Canadian CD system. Um, well, the data management plan wouldn't really link to the Canadian No, I, I say because I saw that you have PIs listed, so mm -hmm. maybe you can link the PI and then, you there's know, record the publications or something. <coughs> there's a, I know Chuck was talking about yeah. linking it. So um, there's like a longer term hope dream to link it to the common CV, but that's not okay. in place yet. Okay. Yeah. Because DMPs are still an emergent mm -hmm. genre. Sure. Um, whereas in the States, they're yeah, yeah, like yeah. pretty well established as required. It will be eventually probably linked through a lot of systems, hopefully. Um, if you're talking about the PIs, it might be through something like an ORCID ID, if you, mm -hmm, any mm -hmm. of you have heard of that. But yeah, I'm going to pass this off to Leslie. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the document, well, the staying organized section which is really just um, me constantly and frequently saying, please document everything. Um, and I, and it's like a really unsexy topic, and I know no one likes talking about documentation, and no one actually likes doing it. We all love the idea of documentation, like we adore the idea of documentation, and when it comes time to do it, um, we don't. But seriously, with your data, especially if you have mountains of it, you're going to end up having like significant problems. And I've even dealt with groups with really relatively boutique amounts of data who don't know who has the data, who don't know where the data is. What server is this on? I can't remember. No one wrote it down. I don't know how you made this. I don't know what we did to it. Um, and it, if you don't have the answers to those questions, you suddenly just have a mountain of really useless stuff. Um, and so yeah, who is involved and stewardship, who is in charge? So I know one of you said I'm in charge of managing data and I know in some labs that person is designated with other groups and it, it might just be you alone, which is fine. Um, but in some groups it's sort of more tacit or happens by accident. I would really suggest not letting that happen by accident and, and just identifying someone who can at least stay on top of it. Um, 
And so what everyone's role is, and then really importantly, as I bolted it, and you can tell what you have, um, everyone thinks that they'll know, but you don't once you end up with these really deep um, folder structures and directory structures and really large amounts of things. Um, where it is, what's been done to it, um, and then I, it doesn't have to be fancy. You can just have a text file or whatever and just keep a copy of it with your data. Hopefully in one of the highly direct, like the root directory, you know, at the start of things where you can find it. Um, people always say, I'll remember, and you really won't, like you think you will, but in six months you won't, and in six years you won't, depending on how long you keep it, and the phrase itself documenting is not true, like it's just not true. It's not true about code, and it's not true about your data either. So write it down and put that text file or whatever, you know, a spreadsheet, whatever kind of document you like, but have something that actually tracks what's going on. Um, I would always suggest using version control if it's relevant. So Git is the one I know. Yeah, we're going best, to be talking. So they're going to be talking about it, uh, especially if you're running lots of scripts um, or altering them over time. If you are running scripts, keep keep them, but also if you're really going to be running a lot, keep a copy of the script with the data set so that the relationship between the two, you're just co-locating them, right? So that the relationship between the two is obvious um, to you and anyone else, so that it's not mysterious. Um, and if you use set specialized software and it, it's at all possible, I would highly recommend keeping a copy of that software somewhere. Um, and at, at the very least, document which version of the software you've been using so that if someone else needs to um, work with your data using this proprietary software, they can figure out what it is. Um, in terms of description, and you know, I don't use the term, well, I'm going to talk about it in a bit, but we're not going to talk a lot about metadata, but when I talk about description, I really am talking about metadata, um, but in a much, not so much technical metadata sort of sense, more in a stuff people need to know to retain the context around objects. As Dylan said, you know, time is the enemy of context, and describing things is really meant to maintain that context, to maintain meaning over time, um, both for yourself and for anyone else who might encounter your data. So, um, and I see this as part and parcel of documentation as well. Um, it's just a little bit more formalized in some contexts. So, um, one is to keep a code book or a data dictionary. If you're using codes or creating databases, explain what your terms are and use, I mean, in librarianship, we call it controlled vocabularies, but whenever possible, use the same terms. Like, don't use a bunch of synonyms is what I mean. Like, don't don't have five synony synonyms that perform the same function within your study. Choose one and then somewhere else designate what that means and you can expand on that, but having to do that once is a lot easier than having to after the fact reconcile all of these things. Um, you might want to get into your sort of methods and formal metadata, and we'll talk about this when we talk about preservation and sharing. Um, the, the, Platforms that require formal metadata will often ask for, you know, your methodology and how you created the data. And it might be good for you to have that backstory just for yourself and for, you know, colleagues and others. And especially if you're planning on writing a, a data paper, which Dylan will talk about later, because um, you more or less will have written your data paper if you write that. Um, and who has the rights to your data? That's probably important information to keep with your data as well. If you are limited by intellectual property or you have a commercial funding agency or whatever else, um, thinking about rights and who's involved, just put that with your documentation, something else to think about. And honestly, anything else you might find relevant, I would also include in description. So for a general organization, um, the question, everyone knows what to do, I think. They say, oh, I'm gonna create a naming convention. I'm going to create a like directory structure. And everyone instinctively, I think, 
feels they know how to organize things. The real issue is doing it, and you have to use these. Um, so if you can auto-generate your naming convention, do it. It makes life easier and more likely to happen. Um, but it's really important to have, I think it's really important to have a naming convention, especially if you have lots and lots of files. Um, and I would make the, the naming convention intelligent, by which I mean embed human readable information in that title. So that if you look at a title, you can say, oh, I can tell this was made on this date, or I can tell that this is the important variable that changed, or something um, that indicates to you as an end user why, why this title is what it is. Random, meaningless strings of numbers and letters are not useful. And sometimes that's what happens with auto-generated names from software. Um, all of the usual rules apply, especially if you're going to be addressing, like if you're going to be using stuff in a Unix system, no spaces, no special characters in your file names. Unix doesn't like them. Um, lots of software doesn't like them, so don't. Um, and in terms of creating a directory structure, it sounds like some of you are having the frustration that the software is creating its own arbitrary directory structure. Is it arbitrary or does it just like balloon out in some... What do you mean by arbitrary? Though? Like there's no organi like there's no useful organizing principle. There is, it means like, it is organized. Yeah. It's just a lot of them. Okay, so it's like the number yeah. rather than the... So like within one subject and then all these analyses different analyses and like half different folders. Right, okay. And so it's just like this proliferation. Mm -hmm. They're I, it sounds like the company is trying its best, I think, but, um, but if you don't have software that's doing that, you should think about what a meaningful organizing principle is. Um, and that just means how, how you might even move around within a directory structure. Try to make it as convenient for yourself as possible. Um, so like keep the big distinctions higher up in the directory structure and the, you know, so you might be moving within that folder more rather than constantly bouncing up and back and down. It just makes life easier. Um, all of this description and documentation is meant to really help you guys during the process of research and of course afterwards. Um, but we'll, we'll pay off uh, a ton when you think about retention and preservation. Um, retention is retention is a misleading term. We use it in librarianship. It really means what are we going to throw away. It's not what are we going to keep. Um, because if you talk to any archivist, they'll tell you we can't keep everything. I mean, the mounds of things we make in the world, it's just impossible for us to keep them. So we need to apply principles to decide what it is that is worth keeping. And I would apply, I would use the same process when thinking about one's own research data. Yeah. Um, sometimes maybe you don't know right away. Right. So, so what should be kept and what should be discarded. Right. And so if you don't, then you can, you can make like, only you can really make an informed decision on that front. I would personally say if you had to wait, like if it was quick, and sort of derived, and you knew you could make it again, then why, you know, and you're not gonna use it for the next six months, then, and eh, like if you think it's gonna be useful, keep it and put it someplace where it stays safely. Mm -hmm. If it's not really gonna be useful and you've made that determination, go ahead and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing I'm suggesting is if you think it's gonna be useful, keep it, but don't not throw things away once they're not useful. Right. I think people start to hoard because they think that's useful. <clears throat> and I'm saying like no, no useful repository is a hoarded repository. It's a repository you've made decisions about, you've thought about, um, and all of its, all of its, all of the parts of its collection make sense there. Um, so it's just about taking some time to think about what's useful in a real way. So these are some of the questions. I came up with this uh, when thinking about this. I'm sure there are others that are relevant to you. Um, one of the ones that uh, the sign up guys suggested is, would you pay for it? If you wouldn't pay to keep it, you probably shouldn't keep it. 
I never think about it in terms of paying to keep it. I don't know why I should, but I, I think that's a really great question. So obviously if you know, you're in the middle of the study and you're like, oh my gosh, I need all this stuff to be able to write and da da da, like, yes, keep it. But once that's done, if you know you can just generate this again in a couple of hours, it might not be worth just holding on to everything. Um, at the same time, sometimes you do have to keep it. And there are some, aside from immediate usefulness to your study, there are some other considerations you might want to think about. Uh, REB sometimes ha tells you to keep stuff or get rid of stuff. So always pay attention to what they tell you to do. Um, some publishers will want you to retain certain stuff. Some funding agencies will want you to retain stuff. Um, and so if you keep those things in mind, that might also influence what you decide to keep and what you decide to, to discard. But um, all of these factors are in play. In terms of preservation, someone mentioned keeping things over the long term. Um, all, everything I said about description holds especially true with preservation. Um, I think of preservation as uh, making things meaningful and useful over a long period of time. And that means, you know, whether analog things or digital things, it's just sometimes really difficult to keep things meaningful over a long period of time. Because as we said, time erodes context and suddenly you don't understand how or why this thing was made. Um, we always suggest that if you're planning on preserving, um, save your files in a non-proprietary format. And if that's not possible, it is now especially crucial for you to include a copy of that software um, and document what software you use to make it, uh, or else it will be really difficult for anyone to ever open those files again, possibly. I mean, you know, err on the side of, of going non-proprietary. Um, so description, I think when it, when it comes to preservation, you'd, at some point, you could always preserve on your own. And I think if you have giant amounts of data, you might want to think, and you don't think you're going to touch it for a long time, you might think about tape as an option. Um, but another option is to turn to repositories. Um, and repositories will most likely start asking for what they'd call metadata, which is really just the description you've been making all along diligently, um, but formalized into what we call fields. Um, so think of fields as just like the column in your spreadsheet and each of the items is a row. Um, so one metadata standard I know you're all probably familiar with is the bibliographic metadata standard that we use in the library because every time you look something up you're searching on those fields the title the author the call number if you're like really in the know or the subject headings and all those different facets of information are fields metadata fields for a standard um, for data there are tons and tons of standards have been developed if you're looking at a particular repository and you're confused, this is the point at which you reach out to a librarian because it's our job to engage with these descriptive standards um, and we can help sort it out. But if you have that documentation and description that you've been working on throughout the process, making your metadata is gonna be way, way easier. Um, it's just not gonna be the sort of struggle to go back and try to reconstitute what happened. Um, and describe it. And uh, if you know ahead of time that you plan on depositing things in a repository, check out what they ask for, because then you can very easily make your metadata as you go along, instead of having to do it retroactively. Um, and Dylan's gonna talk a bit about some of the repositories you might look at as she talks about sharing. <laughs> Does anyone currently use someone else's data? Like, did you get it from a repository or? No, I do. Like a group? Yeah. Yeah. So there's two different types of sharing. There's the sharing that you do with your collaborators or people that work in your field that you say, hey, I want to work off this. Can you send me these files? Or that you're working in conjunction with. There's also the idea of sharing outwardly. So that would be making data available to anyone. Um, 
So I guess one of the things that I want to emphasize is that that sharing outwardly um, and preservation or retention don't necessarily go hand in hand. So you can share your data without preserving it and you can preserve your data without sharing it. So sharing data has a lot of benefits. Um, it benefits you in some ways. Uh, it can save you time if people are going to be asking you for this, you know, kind of remove that middleman step where people are emailing you and asking you for copies of things. Um, it can also help maintain your data integrity because when you're planning to share it means you're more actively managing your data and your outputs along the way. Um, and it can also help you understand your data in the future to have managed it to the point of sharing because you're thinking about how other people would interpret it. You know, that's also your future self. Um, it can also help support um, the idea of research moving forward. If you're sharing your data, other people are getting similar results by rerunning or doing a similar study, it can kind of give the integrity to your data that your conclusions stand. It can also um, preserve your data. As I mentioned, you don't have to be preserving your data to share it, but where you choose to share your data may also offer some preservation. So if you're considering sharing outwardly in a repository or an archive, check their policy. See how long they're going to guarantee that they'll keep it for. Um, it can also, as I mentioned, increase your research impact. So um, sharing can impact the discovery and relevance of your own research. It also can benefit others. So as I mentioned before, it can lead to unexpected discoveries. Um, it can prevent duplication of efforts. And one of the things to think about here is <coughs> negative results. Sharing negative results isn't usually done in like a journal article fashion, but sharing negative results as data can be really valuable to other people so that not, you know, 20 of us sitting around a table that are working in labs across the world aren't repeating the same attempts. So negative results are really important and data is one way that we can share that. Um, you can also provide research material to those with little or no funding. A really great example of this is um, Brittany Wanger, who won the Google Science Award. It's for high school students in 2012. She just used data that existed, and she um, developed a new mechanism for an early indicator for breast cancer. So zero money to her. She just reused someone else's data, won an award for it, and now we have new early indicators. Um, you can also support the idea of open access. So you can be a catalyst for research and discovery as part of the open access data movement. Um, and the thought behind this movement is that research should be available to all, not just those who are able to afford it. Um, there's also a disciplinary benefit to sharing data. It moves disciplines forward. I think the greatest example of this is the Human Genome Project. What we did together was far faster than what one person could do to um, map the human genome by themselves. There's also some concerns about sharing data, so I don't want to just promote that as the idea of the perfect world. Um, one of them is intellectual property rights, and that's really important in a research group or when you're getting funding from a place, especially if it's an industry funder, that you understand what you own and what responsibilities you have to other people involved in the project. Um, so there's some great guidance in the School of Graduate Studies policies that can help you navigate that. Um, another concern is that people don't want to lose control of their data, that things might be done with it that they never intended, which can happen. People fear criticism of either their management or their process, or people not understanding how they reached the conclusions that they did. There's also some legal ramifications to be concerned about. In some cases, you can't share data, so those working with human subjects um, have to go through extra steps, and you have to state on the onset of your research that you're going to do this, ensure that you have consent from these people to, to share data about them, because you can't go, it's harder to go back than to do from the beginning. Uh, some people may fear getting scooped, so there's that idea that you might be in a patent situation or that you wish to extract further value from the data and you don't think someone who didn't put the time and energy into, that, into the project that you did should have the ability to publish based off of your findings. Um, one of the biggest things that we hear from people is that the sh uh, benefits of sharing data are unclear. Um, that kind of response of who would want it, it's not really in a state to be published. Um, but remember, if you're planning and managing your data along the way, you can mitigate a lot of these concerns. You can set up, um, like if you're working with the REB, you can state this is how we're going to share it. You can get that informed consent signed. So managing your data along the way can help you mitigate worries about sharing. But you may also have to share your data. As I mentioned earlier, CIHR is the only funding agency in Canada that right now has a very specific data sharing policy. But you also might be asked to share your data um, 
from the publishers that you're interested in publishing with. So one of the things to do is, you know, when you're a student, you're looking at high impact journals and things in your field that matter. If you know you want to be publishing in a certain journal, check their requirements. They're found in the um, instructions to author section and it will detail if you're required to share data. Sometimes depending on the type of data, it will tell you very specific places you have to put it. So why this is important is again, you can work along the way to have your data in a format that's ready to be shared and you know what metadata standards they're expecting and you know what's required of you before submission to the publisher. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you can share your data, if you've mitigated those concerns, you can also consider data and output of your research in a very similar fashion that you consider a, a journal publication and output of your research. So there's a few ways to publish data. One is a supplementary material attached to your article, so it's like a bundle. Um, or you can consider a data publication as a standalone publication, which can be linked to the papers that are based off of that data. Um, so you could put it in a repository for that. So there's a lot of discipline specific repositories. For example, if you're working with proteins, you could put it in the protein data bank. And then other researchers looking for proteins might find yours and use it. Um, you could also publish it as a data paper or in what we call a data journal. So what this means is you publish a brief description about the data, what you've done to it, your methods, um, what type of data it is, variables contained, and then you think about potential reuse. So again, if you're publishing your data, suddenly you're getting more publications out of the same amount of effort that went into creating a journal publication, um, which may make your research more visible. It might be used for different people for different things, which can increase your research profile. And if you've managed your data along the way, it takes minimal effort to publish it. So these are just some examples of some of the repositories that exist. Some of them are very general, some of them are very specific. but does anyone put data in a repository right now? Does your research group do that? Yeah? I use the Open Science Framework. Open Science, okay. <laughs> yeah, so. Which is great because you get a wiki yeah. along with it. You can uh, link to your GitHub code. So it puts everything you need for a project for you to do it. And then you can easily publish, that, publish it once, you're, once you've submitted the project publication. Right, so it enables those linkages yeah. so that you can connect kind of your interpretation to your results to, yeah. And you can pre-register your study too, which is unique. Yeah, that is, that's interesting. Anyone else use repositories? Do you get data from repositories? <laughs> no repositories, okay. <laughs> well, these are just some of them, but they can be very specific. So TAR is a very specific plant protein database um, about a certain species of plant. Um, the, CDs, the CCDC, which is uh, the Cambridge Structural Database, is for crystallography. It's heavily used because of the way that citations happen in crystallography. Um, some more general ones, Figshare, that's one that can go, you can put anything in Figshare basically. One nice thing about Figshare is that it has a visualization tool built in, so you're able to visualize certain types of data right in Figshare in the repository. As I mentioned, there's the protein data bank, things like um, chemistry has a lot, there's earth science, geon, dryad is earth science as well, but you have abilities to make data available um, the thing that we suggest is if there's a specific type of repository that goes with the type of data you're working with, you might want to put it there because people that are looking for genes will look where genes are stored. People that are looking for environmental data will go to something like Dryad where other like-minded data sit. So the idea of a data paper is kind of a foreign or new concept to a lot of people. Um, usually when you publish an article for your research, it's a specific subset or interpretation of your data. You're looking for something specific, you're looking to prove something, and you're, you're examining something very closely. Um, a data paper, however, is just about the data itself, and it's not about any form of interpretation. So this is just an example from the Journal of Open Archaeological or Archaeology Data, which features peer-reviewed um, data papers describing archaeology data sets. So, the idea of a data paper is that it's published in a journal, so it's published like a journal article. So when you go to something like Web, or Science and Web of Science and you're searching for words, it will come up. So the thing that a data paper really benefits is people outside of your discipline finding your data. It's also a publication. Um, a lot of times when people are looking for data, they'll go to just repositories, and if they don't search in the repository you put your data in, they'll never find your data. This is one way you can bridge that. And as I said, it just contains things like an overview or context, the methods, 
data set description and reuse potential. And what we mean by reuse potential is for the large number of you that are in physics here, I'll use a physics example. So Professor Morris works with icicles and we're working with him to archive some of his data. And one of the reuse potentials he thinks of is like, there's not a lot of realistic depictions of how icicles grow. Perhaps this would be used by Hallmark to create realistic you know, cards <laughs> or a movie set to create realistic icicles. Or if we think about it from an engineering perspective, understanding how icicles grow is really important to things like um, wires or buildings or bridges. So he might publish a data paper describing a reuse potential outside of what he's looking at. So that wraps up Leslie and I's kind of talk. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's a general like push of philosophy to try and get you to think that managing data is important and some of the things that data might do or that you can do to use your data in the future. So I know the University of Toronto has its own resources for sharing uh, papers in T space. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. it also work for just raw data or? You can put data in T space. It's not really great for discovery, but what that does do is preserve it. Do you There's also Dataverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Scholars Portal has. Um, Which is an OCL initiative. It's right. an Ontario based. Um, right. Dataverse is more. Um, meant for data. A lot of people are, so T-Space, because it's an institutional repository, is really a place for papers. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen people doing more often is putting their papers in and then adding data as a supplementary mm -hmm. item, rather than just putting data in. Um, and so Dataverse would be sort of the more, just this is my data. Um, Dataverse generally has a sort of social science-y flavor to it, um, but people from all disciplines have been depositing there. The thing to keep in mind about that is it's not a preservation space, it's just a sharing. Okay. So when you're thinking about sharing data, one of the more important things is discoverability usually, which means you'd probably want to go with a disciplinary repository if one exists. What are the typical... Oh yeah, but... <laughs> yes, uh, in one of the slides you mentioned that should uh, be I wonder if that case would still work in a case that, case that she described, where she has thousands and thousands of folders and secretaries. That approach is still. I mean, you have to. You have to. If you can automatically generate your file names, that would be great. Like if it gives you an option to do that. But otherwise, it's not practicable. Like if it's not really impractical, then you just have to write down somewhere how it seems to work. Just make sure you know what's going on, right? Because it's easy. Everyone thinks they, they'll never forget how it happened <laughs> until you like really quickly forget how it happened. Oh, yeah. And then you end up just with, you know, everything is nothing, right? You, you just need to be able to wade your way through. So whether it's by being able to make your own file names or at least describing how the file names work, that could be another option. It's a very, they can be very effective if you can size your idea within eight characters. If you need to write 132 characters, you could put a name to mean something that is no good anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't scale. Like, but then again, I mean, your file names don't have to be readable if you have a million of them because you're not writing a million of them. Mm -hmm. names, right? But it's for, it's for finding them. So either you have written down somewhere how, how it works. Or you do part of it, like the, you'd have to a directory structure probably anyway. So it says, well, this is project such and such. And this is, this is a weekly file. So at least the name gives you some idea of you know, what it is. So you call like a database because it's linked to? It could be a database. Come, or it could be a convention where you say, well, whenever it says N1000X beyond, like those mean something. But then at the root of that directory tree, or, or in that, it should say, okay. This is what these names mean because you might now know what TBR seven five X P two A exclamation point means, but you won't in six months, right? Yeah. Or, or in a week. Yeah. Think of dates: two thousand sixteen, December seven. You know exactly what it means in any context, right? That makes sense. 
better. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so these, these repositories, they'll only work for modest size data, really. Right? Just getting your stuff there, unless they allow you to put the terabyte <laughs> data. Yeah, <right>? no. <laughs> yeah. There's a limit to things, yeah. right? Which is fine, because if it's, if it's sharing anyway, you're not going to download it either. Uh, is there anything where they they do try and do things at that scale that it won't be immediately online? But so it's okay. Um, the library right now is starting to work on a, a tape storage system uh -huh. um, for really for larger data sets. Right. Um, it won't. So it won't have a sort of discoverable front end, the mm -hmm. same way that a lot of these repositories will. But it's meant to be really long-term preservation right. for stuff, for digital assets. Um, our digital preservation librarian is relatively new, and he's been seriously working on that. And then we're interested in, in looking at ways of making it front end accessible. Um, so that's one option. Um, and I mean, in terms of like, just, I don't, you know, this is sort of my, goes back to my retention thing. If you want to preserve everything for yourself or give it to a place like a library who says, yeah, that works. But if you're going to share it, you should think selectively about what's worth sharing. Like uh, several terabytes of data is probably not, I mean, it might be, in which case, you know, Go for it, but um, it also is worth going through things to root out the stuff that isn't so useful anymore. We should probably ask uh, the guys from astronomy <laughs> how you do it. <laughs> yeah. How do you share the humongous amount of data that you collect yeah. in the telescope? Uh, actually, the, the current model on which we're working is every couple weeks someone comes back from site, which is a suitcase of water. It's, um, well, it's faster, yeah, right? right? Well, it's it's significantly faster and significantly less expensive. Mm -hmm. We're producing about the the full final output of the thing before we compress it is about a gigabyte a second. Right. Okay. So we can't really pipe that over anything. Right. So that's so yeah. I mean the long term storage option. <laughs> Mostly, I'm here for. <laughs> you asked something initially that I was kind of surprised with the number of hands that went up, if I can recall it. Uh, how many people here were using somebody else there? So for the people not raising your hand, are you generating your own data from scratch? Yes. Your own research from nothing? Who's generating his own data from scratch? Yeah. One thing. Our group of people. <laughs> I read paper that said that only three or four percent is new stuff. And seven percent you rely on something that somebody already right. did before you. Everything relies on something. Right? Yeah. It depends what you call something. Yeah. The subject is study, so many other things. It depends on the field. Yeah. yeah. Subject. What you, what you yeah. see, when people get very tired of all this epic board stuff, they do meta studies, right? <laughs> so, uh, and they're going to look at what other people did, and they will actually get to agree with that. And that might be on the rise, because it's getting hard. I mean, it's getting more laborious to do that. So I can, I can see this. But that's even so. <laughs> yeah. One thing I would recommend thinking about is if you are using other people's data, remember other people are going to be using yours. So. As a librarian that sits in an actual library, I see a lot of students coming in and asking for a copy of a thesis. And we get into conversation, and usually it's because they're working off of that person's work, and they might have the data files, but they're using the thesis to try and understand them, which is absolutely ludicrous, in my opinion, because you shouldn't have to read you know, this 150-page something to understand what the data files mean. So be aware that your research, even if you think you're done with it, somebody else might not be in, in your research group. So do you guys know if you still allows people to submit the data with the thesis? 
It's not something that's currently, you know, required. I think in a T space um, deposit, you can add as many supplementary materials as you wish. But it's linked to your thesis. It would. So you, you if have you, like a digital copy of the thesis yeah, in the library. If you, I don't think they've made it. Well, you can add files to that. So if you're adding um, your thesis, you can also add a supplementary data file in the same record. What might be more useful, though, is putting it in a repository and trying to make a note of the linkage. But more importantly, it's about that doc the documentation. Even if you're not sharing the data, right. think about if you're keeping the data and passing it along to somebody, pass along documentation with that file. Because a lot of the times the files are being passed along, they might be perfectly pristine, clearly organized, but it's still about interpretation of what have you done to that data? Did you organize it? Have you analyzed it? Have you cleaned it? Um, what are, you know, even we think as simplistically as a spreadsheet, what do the columns mean? What do your variables mean? What is the definition of this? I think you, Stuart, I mean, so many people were having pretty much start from scratch. Probably an evidence that the people that came before you didn't do a very good job. That's why you have to go for all of it, rediscover it again. Order finally being to get generate more data. I mean, the predecessors could only do 1% of what they could get in data. Yeah. And then why would you even care about that 1% to generate anything? <laughs> <laughs> You're not helping. No, I don't know. Should we hand it off to you guys? So, yeah, yeah we, we can probably do a break, do a break like okay. five, ten minutes break, and then we, we get uh, the hands into the technical side of things. Okay, of course. Oh, I will post the recording here. Can I help it out? Yeah, you can leave it on. Just leave it on? Yeah. Okay. It's not huge. It's, it is. Oh my god. Are you going to